Hey, this is Justin from Ecclesia. We are continuing to walk through the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the disciple Timothy. It is an exciting letter because Timothy has been entrusted with developing a group of Christ followers in this place called Ephesus, and he's now receiving instruction from the Apostle Paul to help him to develop leadership there. And we're going to be looking at the calling of the leader. We're going to be looking at the uh, requirements of a bishop, uh, someone who's there to oversee God's people. And so this is going to be something that's very important for Timothy to focus on because Timothy wants to eventually move on to plant the next church so that the kingdom of God can continue to flourish uh, for, to the ends of the earth. And so the apostle writes, here is a trustworthy saying, if someone is eager for the work of overseeing God's people, the task they seek is a fine one. The bishop must be beyond reproach. He must not have more than one wife. He must be temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, a good teacher. He must not be a heavy drinker or violent, but must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not in love with money. He must be good at managing his own household, with his children being subject to him with all godliness. After all, if a man doesn't know how to run his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert in case he gets puffed up and falls into the devil's condemnation. In addition, he must have a good reputation with outsiders so that he may not incur reproach and fall into the devil's snare. So, initially, the apostle wants Timothy to know that what he's getting ready to tell him is something that he can place his trust in. He wants him to know that someone who is actually looking to oversee God's people, what they're looking to do is a, is a very important role, and it is a fine task to desire. However, he wants them to make sure that they know that the role that they're seeking to step into is to be approached soberly, it is to be approached with humility, and to uh, a significant understanding of, of what they are being called to. Um, so he says, the bishop must be beyond reproach. And so he's going to spend the rest of this portion of scripture expanding on that and helping us to understand what it means for a bishop to be beyond reproach in God's sight. A lot of times we have this idea of perfection that the world gives us. It's based on, you know, all sorts of different input and philosophies and things, but when we think of perfection and we look at Jesus, we see him preaching on the Sermon on the Mount where he says that our Father in heaven, he makes his reign to reign on the just and the unjust alike. And he he has this love that extends to all people. And then he goes on to say, this is Jesus speaking, therefore be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. And so when we talk about being beyond reproach, we're looking for some different standards than the world would be looking for. And so as we unpack this, let's go ahead and uh, see what the Apostle says here. He says, he must not have more than one wife. Now that seems kind of strange to us because in our society, monogamy is pretty normal. Um, but if you go to some places in Africa still, uh, polygamy and being having multiple wives um, simultaneously is still you know, happening in the world. And in those places where churches are planted, where polygamy is a normal thing, the person who's set in charge, the person who's in to be the overseer, should be setting an example of a, an intimate relationship between one man and one woman. And so when we think of an overseer of God's church, the example, even if you're in a society where polygamy is seen as a normal thing, um, it needs to be set upon the overseer or the bishop to be committed to one wife um, in order to set the example uh, for the flock. And so I've also heard that uh, interpreted as the bishop must be a one-woman man. And so, uh, so some people might ask the question, well, can you have a bishop who has been married and then divorced? And the answer to that question is it depends on the circumstances. Um, this is specifically speaking to monogamy versus polygamy, though. The bishop needs to be a person who's committed to one wife. And so it says he must be temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, a good teacher. 
So temperate, basically, he's not to be have, having wild swings towards this or that. Um, he's not to be abusing um, any f form of substance or uh, food, drugs, alcohol. He's supposed to be temperate in all things. In other words, when he thinks things through, when a bishop thinks things through and lives his life in accordance with this, this walk that he has with God, it should not have these wild swings one way or the other. And so you're looking for somebody who's sensible, who can listen to a scenario, who can look at a situation, and who can think sensibly about it. He must be someone who's respectable, someone who is, uh, who in the eyes of the congregation, uh, who are filled with the Holy Spirit, that they can look at him and see that he is a man who genuinely loves. He is a man who demonstrates the uh, the three primary Christian virtues, which, which are faith, hope, and love. He must be hospitable. He must be the type of person who opens his home and welcomes in the stranger, um, as well as uh, as well as the folks from the congregation who sits down and shares meals with people and who isn't you know all haughty and holier than thou. He must be a good teacher. He must be able to understand the things of God and not only understand them, but speak them to God's people for their upbuilding and for their equipping. Uh, the work of ministry has been entrusted to all of God's people uh, as a royal priesthood and as a holy nation. And so the person who is in charge of being a bishop, they need to be able to receive from God and to allow God to speak through them into the lives of his congregation. He must not be a heavy drinker or violent, but must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not in love with money. And so this has to do with a person who takes care of God's temple. Someone who abuses alcohol, an alcoholic, um, would, be, uh, would basically be demonstrating a lack of self-control, which is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. So someone who has the fruits of the Holy Spirit um, that are obviously manifest in their life. They're, the people look at them and they see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. If people see those things happening in that person's life, then most likely they are a good candidate for this role of being a bishop. And he says, um, so they must not be a heavy drinker. So abusing alcohol or abusing substances is, is not going to be conducive with leading God's people. He says, or violent, a person who's violent, who has no control over their emotions and control over their physical body. Um, these are people who are entrusted with stewarding the body of Christ. And so it's very important that they have control over their, their own selves. It says, uh, they must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not in love with money. So they have to be the type of person who can listen to a scenario, who can listen to both sides of it. Um, who, of course, is going to have their own deeply held convictions about life and faith, but who is going to be open to judging situations wisely so that the congregation can flourish and everyone can continue uh, being eager to maintain the unity that the Spirit gives in the bond of peace. So not quarrelsome, not in love with money. Uh, it's written that the, love, that the love of money is actually the root of all evil. And so someone stepping into the role of a bishop um, who's desiring to profit, and that's their primary um, objective, is to profit financially, that would become a serious problem because their love for God's church isn't rooted in the sacrificial love that we see in Jesus. Now, that's not to say what I, we have seen a lot of congregations think that, oh, well, we need to make sure that we keep our bishops and overseers making a very low amount of money so that they you know, don't fall into some sort of temptation when actually Paul speaks directly opposite of that, and he says that the person who, who teaches well and stewards God's people's, people well is actually worthy of double pay or double honor. Uh, so what does that look like practically? Well, if you have a group of 100 people that's being stewarded by a bishop, and the uh, median income of that 100 people is, say, $30,000, then that bishop who's entrusted with overseeing that 100 people ought to earn $60,000. Um, that's just in plain mathematics. Um, but the idea is that the bishop is to be entrusted with God's people, and so by his committing to that life, um, he is worthy of double honor or double pay 
based on you know what he's actually entrusted with stewarding. He says, um, so he must not be in love with money. He must just have a really a desire to help build up and equip God's people for their work of ministry. He must be good at managing his own household. So the idea of managing a household includes so much. It includes not only uh, not only speaking God's word into that household, but it also means stewarding the practical things. And so a man who is unable to or, or not skilled at doing that within his own household would find it extremely difficult to do so in God's household because you know managing a a person's individual household is one thing. You bring in so many other personalities and worldviews when you're trying to bring people together who are, you know, from all sorts of different backgrounds. You know, you have to understand this church is bringing together Jews and Gentiles, people who have completely different backgrounds, completely different worldviews, and the only thing that holds them together is faith in this Messiah, but they are growing into this oneness that we see that they are growing into this unity that is found in Christ, that is given by the Holy Spirit. And so as we come more and more into agreement with one another, the people stewarding that, um, that transition into oneness is going to be you know, met with some serious tasks. Um, and that's why the listening, the gentleness, the patience is so incredibly important. So it says... Um, with his children being subject to him with all, with all godliness. And so the man who is entrusted with being a bishop, he must be able to garner the respect of the entire congregation so that when he speaks, they're receiving from him the, the words that are coming from God and they're perceiving them as God's words. And so if you have folks in the congregation who, who don't see that person as someone that they can receive from, that makes it very, very difficult uh, in order to do what this bishop is called to do. And it says, um, after all, if a man doesn't know how to run his own household, how can he take care of God's church? It goes on to say, he must not be a recent convert in case he gets puffed up and falls into the devil's condemnation. So when a person gets converted to Christianity, there is an infilling of the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, there can be a significant passion for the gospel, and that could lead someone into thinking that all of a sudden they are capable of doing far more than they were previously. And because they have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, that's very true. However, their own heart, their own mind, their own choices that they are empowered to make in being in alignment with the Holy Spirit can cause them to abuse that power in a way which would not be fruitful and the picture that he gives us there is the devil's condemnation. So we know that the devil was a fallen angel, a devil, the devil who is the one who wanted to essentially usurp the position of God. Now, ultimately, we all have one shepherd, the good shepherd, and that is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Creator, the Word, the Spirit. And so he is our good shepherd. And so the person who's entrusted with the position of a bishop is there for a specific purpose to steward God's people until we all achieve the fullness uh, that is the Messiah, where the Father is all and in all, and all other authority structures, all other um, rule and authority will be done away with because God himself will be, uh, will be ruling and reigning in a way that we've never really experienced before, but we have a taste of it in the grace that we've received uh, in the Holy Spirit. And so it says, um, so we want to avoid putting someone in a position of a bishop who's a recent convert. We want to make sure that they've had time to develop the humility, to develop the faith uh, that's necessary to, uh, to operate in this role. And it says, uh, in addition, he must have a good reputation with outsiders so that he may not incur reproach and fall into the devil's snare. So I've been going through the, uh, the book of Acts with a small study group recently, and we see the Apostle Paul, who was entrusted with taking the gospel to, uh, to the nations and standing before kings and governors from different cultures, and the, the reputation that he had um, 
aside from actually persecuting God's church, as far as the law was concerned, the law of Moses, he was he perceived himself to be blameless in that. And so when he was able to stand in front of folks and present the gospel, he was able to do so um, with commanding a certain level of respect, saying, you know, I was... I was of the sect of the Pharisees, which is the most strict sect of Judaism that there is, and these folks know that, and they're aware of that. And so the faith that I'm proclaiming, we I worship God in accordance with the way, just like my ancestors did. I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he had a platform to be able to proclaim Jesus as the promised Messiah that was, uh, that was in alignment with the scripture. And so he's pointing that to, to Timothy, because he wants Timothy's bishops that he appoints to be able to stand in those positions and speak the truth to power in a way that's going to be fruitful. And so this is just an amazing area of scripture, and it's a, an area of scripture that you know, deserves a lot of meditating on and how we can, uh, how we can develop uh, folks who have this kind of character, how we can work with God to develop leaders in our congregation as we go forth to plant more and more churches uh, throughout the world. And so as we look to Jesus as, uh, as our guide in that, uh, th these are very, very good words to wrestle with and to think through, uh, particularly uh, for folks who do desire to be in a task of overseeing God's people. So may God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you, lift up his countenance, be gracious to you, and give you true shalom.